All right. Thank you, everybody, and uh, good morning or good afternoon or wh whatever time zone you're in. Thank you very much uh, for taking the time to join us today. Uh, what we'll be talking about today is uh, a little bit of, re for some of you who haven't um, been to our webinars before, we'll first cover a little bit of the technology behind our dry electrodes, uh, how we have taken uh, EEG into the real world, and then we'll uh, jump into talking about multimodal wearable sensors and how those can really augment uh, EEG and, and sort of what are the multimodal capabilities that we have now brought on board and how to interface them to get a full suite uh, that can uh, really augment what you can do in the real world. So that said, uh, some of you guys already know us. Maybe you have seen us at some conferences or seen a demo or you might own some of our products. So, so you know, we have a broad about breakthrough dry electrodes uh, from uh, developed by a company called Quasar. Those electrodes are allowing us to monitor brain activity in, in the real world and really opening up and revolutionizing the way we do EEG and brain monitoring. Today, we're going to talk about how we're going to cover more than just the brain and how we're now allowing us ourselves to measure a few more modalities, physiological measurements, and again, real world settings. So starting with brain monitoring uh, technologies, we're all familiar with a, with a wide array of technologies such as fMRI and PET and MEG, which allow us to get some really good information about uh, uh, bold signals, uh, by, uh, neurotransmitter binding and uh, electromagnetic activity of the brain. On the ambulatory side, uh, FNIR has uh, started to become uh, more mobile. So this is a way to measure, again, the bold signal from the cortex. There are, of course, implantable electrodes, which are highly mobile once they're implanted, but not quite uh, our ready daily solution. And of course, that leaves us with EEG, which is what we'll be talking about today. If we were to compare these technologies, typically we look at spatial and temporal resolution of the different modalities to compare them. But, on a, but when we want to go to outside of the lab applications, um, ease of use becomes really important, availability of the technology, robustness to uh, environmental and motion artifacts, as well as uh, portability and cost effectiveness. So if we look at all those parameters, we'll, we'll start to see there's a lot of pluses going for EEG here and, and so is FNIRS. Uh, we'll have a separate uh, webinar at the next one in January, we'll, we'll cover EEG and FNIRS. Uh, today we're gonna be focusing a lot more on just EEG. So if EEG is so great, uh, what is it? Uh, well, what EEG is, is a measurement of the electrical activity of populations of neurons when they fire together and they synchronize, their local field potentials can sum through the conductive layers of the, of the brain tissue and even go through the skull bone and the, and the skin, and they can be measured on the surface of the scalp. The way people typically do that is you abrade the skin, which means you rub off the dead layers uh, of cells and uh, the, the skin oils and, and fats um, with some abrasive that uh, can contain some grains of silica or whatnot and can create little micro cracks in the skin. Then you put these electrodes that look like those electrodes shown here in the middle, which have a little hole in the middle, put those metallic uh, electrodes on the surface and you inject through the hole a little bit of gel that can go through those cracks, it makes a very nice low impedance uh, contact with the, um, with the skin, which allows us to measure the very, very tiny uh, EEG signals, which are on the order of microvolts. So what do those signals look like? Uh, on the right side, I'm showing um, some traces of EEG samples, uh, showing that the EEG signals can really reflect the cognitive states uh, underlying in the, in, the, in the brain. So in the red trace, you see on the top, you see the aroused, you can see sort of a, a random structure and the signal. And then when the brain relaxes, you can see the default mode networks start to synchronize and it generates uh, these alpha patterns, alpha bursts or spindles um, that, that can be generated towards the back of the head. Uh, when the person starts to fall asleep, you see uh, uh, sort of higher frequency spindles and then lower frequency complexes. And when they go to deep sleep, you start to see these uh, delta waves, uh, larger amplitude and slower frequency signals. So just by looking at the morphology of the signals, we can get a sense that these signals are reflecting some underlying uh, states uh, of consciousness. We can also look at uh, a lot more. We can look at different uh, brain areas that are being activated. 
And typically the way the analysis is being done is uh, through by, by taking the, uh, the analysis into the Fourier domain. So there we look at uh, frequency bands and we've tended to group those into um, uh, bins or bands and they've been given uh, Greek names. Um, so there's the alpha band from eight to 12, theta from four to eight, et cetera. This allows us to focus on different patterns of activity which have been associated with different uh, cognitive states or different uh, activations, brain area activations. So this has been mainly done for medical diagnostics, uh, for some neurofeedback and quantitative EEG and some neurocognitive research. So if EEG is so great, what has been the limitations of getting it out of the lab? Well, we talked about the, uh, one of the factors, which is the requirement for skin abrasion, which is uh, really a, a painful irritation to the skin uh, which can be tolerated for one or two times if you have a medical need or if you're doing it in a lab setting but it's not something you'll want to do on a daily basis or in a real practical world setting uh, also eeg has been uh, typically seen as uh, very sensitive to motion artifacts and electrical artifacts and that's uh, because of the uh, very small size of the eeg signals compared to the ambient uh, electromagnetic interference and typically the EEGs weren't uh, active, meaning the amplifiers were not right at the electrode. So the, the long cables could pick up uh, electrical artifacts. And if people started to move, those cables moving around could pick up even more artifacts, as well as the person's body moving in space, which could generate a lot of triboelectric artifacts. So all of which made it very difficult to, to be ambled through with EEG. Also to analyze the data, you need to have some kind of time synchronization to give you some context of what's going on. Uh, with, with regards to the EEG signal, so you can analyze it. Uh, and they're usually the acquisition systems were usually quite large and, and embedded into computers, so they were not very easily portable. All of which made it very unpractical to do this in real or virtual worlds. In the previous seminar, we talked about uh, doing EEG in virtual worlds. Uh, you can watch that uh, webinar uh, online. At the end, we'll give you a link. Uh, but today, we're, not gonna, we're just going to be talking about real world applications. So on this slide here on the bottom right, you're going to see what our technology has come to. And uh, there's going to be a, it's a recorded uh, real-time um, donning of a DSi24 headset on a subject with long hair. So while this is happening, I will describe how our technology works, how we have solved um, the matter of um, uh, doing EEG in the real world. So we started off with a mission that was initially funded by DARPA and later by NSF, uh, NIH, we had funding from the Army and Navy and a um, number of other research uh, funding institutions. So their mission was uh, very simply initially, no skin abrasion, no gel or liquids. So uh, we had developed uh, ultra high impedance amplifier and capacitive amplifiers. And we brought those two things together into what we call the hybrid ultra high impedance and capacitive amplifier. We gave it some pins and we made it go through hair and we were starting to record some EEG signals. Sponsor said, that's great, but we really need to make sure that the signal quality is matching the, what we're getting with our conventional systems. So we did um, a number of uh, data uh, analyses and, and recordings to show that the signals were indeed matching. And on the bottom left, you can see some alpha recordings between our dry hybrid electrodes and the conventional medical grade EEG electrodes. And you can see the morphologies match, you can see the amplitudes match, and we were getting better than 90% correlations. Sponsors were happy and they said, okay, but what about uh, artifacts? We hear EEG is very prone to artifacts and dry electrodes are, are the worst. And that was true. When we're not rubbing the skin, we are having a very high contact impedance. We're going to be prone to picking up a whole lot of electromagnetic interference. So the first thing we did is we took an active sensor. So the, the, those pins here, we use um, the silver silver chloride, which has low noise properties. We have the amplifier immediately behind them, right inside this red disc. Um, so the, this qualifies a active electrode with the, our uh, hybrid resistive and capacitive sensors inside there. And then we put the whole thing inside the Faraday cage. A Faraday cage is an electrical shield. So here's the one part of the Faraday cage and here's the back plane. And it protects uh, the sensors, the electrode and the sensors from pickup. The only place that's open is the bottom. So this is the signals are going to be coming in from the head, will go and get amplified inside the Faraday cage before they exit and go to the digitizers to get digitized. So that protected us from electromagnetic interference. And this spring that you're, you're seeing here in this little videos, 
uh, provided us a mechanical stability. So if the headset were to move, the electrode stays put on the head and you can see uh, that the um, uh, contact is going to be maintained. So this allows us some mechanical isolation towards motion artifact. So these are just a few of the examples of electrical and mechanical engineering that went into designing the sensors to make them work as well as they do. And then the sponsor said, okay, great. Um, but now we need a headset that's easy to put on, can be self-donned, fast to put on, and comfortable to put on for daily use, for eight hours a day, every day of the week. So we entered the business of headset design, and I'm showing you a few later some of the headsets we've come up with. But those are very important factors if you're going to take EEG for real-world applications where you're going to be doing EEG more than once uh, on, the, on the week or a lifetime for the person. Lastly, we had to make this ambulatory. We had to, of course, make it wireless and we had to make it so that all the acquisition could be on board and synchronized and you could get around in the real world. So I'm going to show you what the data looks like. So you just saw the subject here get uh, the headset put on in under three minutes. Now I'm going to show you a video of uh, the data streaming. When I start the video, your screen may uh, pop into um, a small a shrink a little bit please feel free to expand that back into full view uh, so that you can see the video um, at full scale so what you're seeing now is the eeg streaming from this headset from the subject uh, via bluetooth and uh, you'll see on the top channels those are uh, the um, electrodes that are on the front and so you will see some blinks in a second so here is three blinks and the subject blinked three times um, and the rest of it is uh, just showing the resting state EEG. And the next uh, second, we're going to ask the subject to uh, bite. So the subject is biting a few times and you can see the EMG. You can see the EMG on all the electrodes because the EMG signal is very large and gets conducted through the skin. And um, we can see the EEG artifacts uh, settle back down. Now here we ask the subject to close her eyes and you can see the alpha patterns emerging mostly towards the back um, of the head. And this is the sinusoidal waves that you're seeing here. Now the subject opened her eyes. And uh, next we're going to ask her to, uh, I'm going to tap my feet next to her. So this is me generating a lot of, tri you can't see it's off the screen obviously, generating a lot of triboelectric artifacts. So this red channel that we're showing is the common mode on the body. So this is the electrical signals carried by uh, the subject. Now the subject is tapping her foot. She's generating a lot of triboelectric discharges and you can see those very large signals on her body, but not in the EG channels. Next, I'm removing the low pass filter up here. And now you can see 60 Hertz pickup. That's the mains frequency. And the subject is putting her foot on electrical cable, shielded, uh, covered, protected with uh, rubber. Uh, and you can see a very large uh, pickup on this red channel, but nothing was affected in the EG. So we're really immune to these electromagnetic interferences. Now we're gonna ask the subject to walk back and forth and you can see in red, the big artifacts from her feet striking the floor. Those are both electrical and mechanical artifacts, um, but mostly this we're seeing the electrical artifacts on her body. And you can see that the EEG signal is completely unaffected by that. Now we're gonna ask her to move her arms a little bit and you can see again, there's really no interference related to her arm movements. You can see in red a little bit of um, tribal electric from her shirt throbbing against itself. So this is just to showcase, uh, show and illustrate uh, that we can get EEG signals in the um, uh, real world in an ambulatory uh, in an ambulatory setting. Now that we covered uh, that, so what, what I've just shown you is that we have dry electrodes for EEG. They get really high good qu signal quality. They're artifact resistant. And we have headsets that are fast to put on. You have to trust me that they're comfortable. Uh, and hopefully you, if you haven't tried them, let us know. We'll be happy to send you some samples or, or set up a demo. Uh, and they're wireless. And we have uh, different setups for uh, everyday use, for sleep, and also for virtual reality. So now, Today, I wanna to talk about the expansion pack. So now that we have EEG that we can take to the real world, we want to add some additional modalities. We want to sense um, other things from the body that we can correlate. Uh, so we can uh, either for uh, enriching the data set or for uh, uh, strengthening the case of what is happening. 
So the expansion pack I'm going to cover, I'm going to talk about ECG, uh, electrocardiograph, EMG, electromyograph, EOG, electrooculograph, GSR, galvanic skin response, respiration, skin temperature, 3D accelerometers. Also going to briefly touch on motion tracking and eye tracking. Uh, and I'm sorry, we also have systems that uh, integrate FNIR and EG. But those last three topics will get their own individual webinars. Uh, sorry about that. They have their own individual webinars in the, in the coming period. So I'll, we'll just briefly touch on those today. Uh, so the sensors. Um, we have on the right again. We'll be showing you the donning of what it looks like to don uh, the sensors. Um, so there are differential or referential. Sorry, I don't know what that was. Uh, there are differential or referential uh, sensors that uh, can have uh, two sensors um, that can be referenced to one another. And this way you can get one channel uh, digitized at one time. Uh, and this would be what you get the ECG traces from. You can also do referential where you'd have a single electrode uh, referred to the reference of the system that allows you to go in software and do re-referencing and get different uh, vectors of ECG with fewer electrodes. You saw the uh, harness being put on with the dry electrode. We can also use stick-on electrodes uh, in case you are like this uh, chest here with the six pack and no hair, and you can use a stick-on. Otherwise, it's just as well to use the dry electrodes with the harness, uh, and it, they work quite well. The applications of uh, ECG are often looking at heart rate or heart rate variability from which you can get measures of stress or fatigue. You can also get measures of fitness. You can get, obviously, medical uh, information for medical research, and you can do biofeedback. And there are wider even range of applications. Uh, for EMG, so now we're looking at the muscles. Again, the sensors can be differential and or referential. In a differential configuration, you get the information about the, if you put the sensors on the same muscle, you can get really localized information about just this particular uh, muscle bundle that's underneath the electrodes. In a referential configuration, you can get the more broader information about uh, the, uh, the muscle activity, uh, or at least you can get the envelope of the EMG and kind of know whether there has been some activation or not. This is what the EMG signals look like. So you have the pre-EMG, uh, and then you have the large uh, high-frequency EMG signal coming in. Uh, the electrodes can, again, be dry or, or stick on wet. Uh, dry, as you saw in the video, uh, being uh, applied. The applications range from biomechanics, looking at the amounts of uh, force uh, that the muscles are applying, looking at ergonomics for posture and tension. Uh, doing medical research, such as gait research or um, rehabilitation, uh, doing biofeedback. So there's a wide range of applications. Again, this it's always, um, you can do this by themselves, of course, um, but it's really useful to have this data along with the EEG so that you can correlate what you're seeing on the physiology along with what's happening in the brain. Uh, EOG, uh, so you're going to see the donning on the right. Again, those can be differential um, so that you can get uh, a vector from one pair of electrodes. And that would typically, if you arrange them as shown on the, on the bottom left, you have a horizontal pair and a vertical pair so that you can do um, two vectors of horizontal and vertical EOG. Uh, you can also uh, position them in, uh, in a way where one is above the eye, one is uh, below the outer canti of the eye so that you can have a hybrid EOG vector. Uh, in case you wanted to, do, you had a headset which has an FP2 electrode, you might use a monopolar or referential and then in software recalculate these vertical um, uh, EOG channel. Again, you can do um, dry electrodes or wet electrodes. Uh, you get the same signal quality. It's just a matter of what's more convenient. On the face, we find the wet electrodes are more convenient since for the dry electrodes, you have to tape over the sensor and that's just gonna, it's a little bulkier and more tape. Um, so here's a recording of what the EOG looks like. So the subject here is moving his eyes left and right and you can see the EOG trace, uh, tracing that very nicely. Uh, so what are the main applications? Most often people recording EOG with EEG are doing it to remove the EOG artifacts from the EEG. 
In the old days, people used to do eye tracking from this uh, signals as well. It is still done sometimes, but with the advent of uh, the fast and high accuracy cameras, um, IR cameras, you're getting much cheaper eye tracking with dedicated eye tracking systems. You can also do fatigue monitoring by looking at the rate of blinks and the percentage of time that the um, blinks is happening. We call that that's called, often referred to as per clause. And there are a few other applications of EOG. GSR, galvanic skin response. So here there are two sensors that are typically put on the fingers. Uh, you can also put the dry electrodes on the wrist. Um, so you put them side by side. And what you're looking at is the um, uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, responses of the body as you get stressed, you sweat a little bit more. And so you look and see what is the uh, change, uh, conductivity change on the surface of the skin. Um, so on the top right, I'm showing an example here where over a very long time course, uh, there were a number of claps that happened. Those were, those are the vertical blue lines and the, so they're clapped right next to the subject's ear. So they get startled and you can see a very large uh, GSR response in, uh, right after the, um, the clap event. So this is what um, a GSR signal would look like if you take it on a large time course. Applications of GSR often involve looking at stress, looking at emotional arousal, looking at cognitive workload, looking at lie detection. Those are all uh, applications of it. So it's often used for um, neuromarketing or neurobiofeedback. Um, so those are some of the applications. Respiration. So respiration, our sensor is a stretch sensor. It's a piezoelectric uh, a stretch sensor, and we built it into an elastic strap. Here you can see it has a little uh, cover that can protect the, the sensor, and the signals will reflect the um, enlargement and shrinkage of the rib cage as the person breathes in and out. Applications, again, stress is a very common one, mental workload, emotional arousal, uh, fitness, uh, medical applications, looking at the respiration and the um, uh, effects, and biofeedback, training people to control their breathing and, and during meditation. So all of, all of those are some of the applications of a respiration sensor. Temperature. So in this case, this is uh, we have implemented the thermistor sensors that can be applied on the surface of the skin. Uh, the outputs can be in Fahrenheit or Celsius. You can see the trace is a little flat. Well, that's because there's not much uh, changes happening over a period here of 10 seconds um, on the temperature uh, of the person. However, it can be still useful for either uh, stress monitoring or emotional arousal, fitness, uh, medical applications, as well as biofeedback, where the um, uh, you put the sensor in this case instead of on the chest you can put it on the hands and look at the uh, drop in temperature or increase in temperature as the person relaxes or stresses uh, it's important here to protect the temperature sensor from the environment and so and you can see in this case we put it under this band uh, so that it's protected from wind and cooling effects so that it's indeed measuring the in environment in which it's in which is at the interface on the skin uh, 3D accelerometer. So we have embedded the uh, MEMS uh, devices into each of our sensors, uh, headsets. So you can see as the subject is tilting his head left and right, you can see the um, sensors are tracking that and then he'll move his head, tilt his head back and forth and you can see the other axis is reflecting that. Now you can see the EEG data isn't very affected except to pick up some of the EMG activity from his neck uh, as increased EMG activity. Uh, the output is um, giving us uh, the raw uh, um, data from all three dimensions in gravity. And the applications are often for movement tracking, um, rehabilitation, artifact decoding, and artifact reduction. So we don't recommend you use the uh, artifact signal for direct linear regressions. However, you can use it to denote, demarcate where areas of noise or movement are happening. All right, and lastly, EEG. I'm not going to talk again about the EEG. We already covered that. I'm just going to mention the different headsets we have and what stage of readiness they are to receive those multimodal inputs. So our DSi24 and our DSi EEG plus FNIR both have three auxiliary channels that are available and ready to plug in those auxiliary uh, multimodal sensors we just talked about. Uh, the DSi7 and the VR300 
they have, um, you can substitute three of the EEG channels for up to three of the EEG channels with the sensor. So that's something we'd have to do at the factory. You decide which sensors you want to sacrifice, you let us know what you want to put instead and we take care of that for you. On the ZSI 7 Flex, there you can substitute any channel with any of the sensor modalities. So this could be a multimodal sense system by itself that can be synchronized to work with uh, any of the other devices using our Trigger Hub. And the DSI 4, that is a sleep uh, design, had, had been designed for sleep. It is currently not designed to work, uh, to have any inputs from uh, the, the multimodal sensor. So you, if you wanted to use um, the four with multimodal, you'd have to use it with a flex. This, uh, in the case of all the sensors I showed you today, the acquisition is happening on the DS, on the headsets. So the synchronization is happening because all the data is uh, collected at the headset. Uh, in case you're using a flex, you would synchronize the two devices via Trigger Hub, but the data would be collected by the electronics I usually designed for EEG. Um, the data that can be stored on board the devices, uh, as well as the power sources in the device, and the 3D accelerometer is embedded. It's an option that's embedded in each of the devices. All right, so now we're going to show you a few demonstrations of that, uh, of those signals. So first, we'll show you um, again. The screen may uh, shrink uh, for you. You can go ahead and uh, put it back into full screen. You can see the subject is currently wearing an ECG and an EMG, uh, as well as an EOG. So you can see the ECG uh, traces. While he's moving, they're not affected by movement, and now he is clenching his arm, so you can see the EMG on his arm, increase the EMG, and he's walking, and he relaxes his uh, muscles, and you can see the drop in EMG. In this case, the subject was uh, staring straight on, so there was no EOG uh, picked up by the EOG sensors. Uh, the next video I'm going to show you is a um, demonstration of the GSR and skin temperature and respiration. Um, so in this case, the subject is getting ready to prick his finger with a screwdriver, and uh, in a second, you can see his respiration, and now he pricks his finger, and you can see in two seconds later, the GSR, and highlighted in red, uh, starts to go up, and then within a few seconds, it starts to go back down. Now the temperature in this case is not affected at all, so it's pretty stable. And respiration, uh, you know, had a little fluctuation when he started himself, but then it's you can see the sinusoidal shape of his respiration. So this is just a nice illustration of how you could uh, do GSR. We don't recommend uh, pricking yourselves uh, very often, but uh, just for demonstration purposes. All right, so the next question typically comes up is, uh, well, uh, that's great. You've shown us a whole lot of uh, seven different uh, sensor modalities, and now you're asking us to choose between three of them. What if we want to do more? What if we want to do uh, multimodal sensing with many more sensors? Well, that's where you have the uh, uh, TA suite can come in. So TA Ergo is a French company. Uh, that has been in uh, developing uh, cutting edge uh, wearable sensor technologies for the past 20 some years. And they've developed a suite of sensors, which I'll uh, highlight in a second. And they've uh, designed them to work with either a T logger, which is shown in this picture, which allows you to record the data uh, on this device without the need for a computer. So this device can synchronize everything and collect it uh, on your, you know, while being worn on the pocket and it collects the data from up to 32 systems. Or they have a system that they call T-Recorder, which can be plugged into a computer and collects the data from uh, up to 32 channels with two recorders uh, and gets them all into their software. So what are the sensors that they support? They also have GSR, they have temperature, they have ECG, they have respiration, they have EMG, surface EMG, and this is a bipolar configuration. 
they have an accelerometer and they have a universal sensor which is really great it allows you to connect a wide range of sensors uh, to this uh, device so it becomes wireless so you can uh, they have uh, four sensors goniometers uh, torsiometers all of those can be connected and they have some uh, already pre-built and last but not least they have a motion uh, tracker so that's an imu an inertial motion unit and what that is, is those are sensors that you can put on each uh, of your joints and they will track the angle, the speed and acceleration of joint movement. So this allows you then to reconstruct this and create an avatar in real time and see the person and, me and do some measurements of uh, how they move. Most importantly, those uh, IMUs that they've developed are really um, unmatched in terms of their immunity to magnetic disturbances. So just like our EEG hardware and, and systems are immune to electromagnetic interference, their IMUs are as well. And that's it's quite unique. It makes a very nice, robust solution for real-world uh, applications. So what's, uh, what's great about the TA system is their Captive software. So Captive software acts as a hub that allows you to input videos and a whole bunch of the sensors that we discussed um, that I just showed you, as well as eye tracking from different manufacturers, as well as a number of other sensors from different manufacturers, all come into the Captive suite. They all get synchronized automatically for you. All the data is collected. You can output it raw data as CSV. You can do some basic analysis and some reports in there. You can do manual encoding or automated encoding of events. So you can, for example, determine different angles, you can do some EMG analysis, you can do some heart rate uh, variability analysis, you can do some arousal analysis based on GSR, you can do some facial coding. All of these are built into this captive suite. So I'm gonna show you a quick example of uh, that, uh, just to give you a sense of what the software looks like um, when it's running. So again, your, your screen might shrink when the video starts. Okay, so here you're seeing a person being outfitted with the 3D um, IM, uh, motion sensors, the IMUs. We're also putting some EMG sensors on him and some ECGs, as well as an eye tracking uh, glasses uh, so that you can see where he's looking at and you can see what his uh, uh, wrists are doing, what his uh, arms are doing. And all of this can get sent directly into uh, Captive for analysis. So here you can see the uh, uh, EMGs, you can see the heart rate, you can see his avatar, you can see what he's doing. Again, the real value of this is how much easier uh, all the analysis becomes. Uh, so you can do some uh, integrated analysis, you can do some correlations between the signals, uh, so that you can see what you know. When is his stress level happening? When is he really stressed out about this? When you know how is his muscle? How are his muscles doing at that same time? All right. So with with this, I'm I'm really concluding. Uh, um, yeah, and of course, you can also bring all of this into the virtual world as well with Captive. They have a virtual reality module. Uh, so with this, I wanted to conclude and, and just kind of summarize real quickly. So we have um, developed uh, dry electrodes that allow you to do EEG in the real world. We have now augmented them with a range of um, multimodal sensors, of, including ECG, EEG, uh, ECG, EMG, EOG, uh, galvanic skin response, and um, respiration, skin temperature, and 3D accelerometers. Um, using the Captive suite, you can also interface with the eye tracking and motion tracking. So uh, I hope that the, 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 and the advantage of all of this is the more modalities you have, the richer your data set is, the more correlations you can do. If you're doing mental workload, you get um, better strength and more ground truth. If you're doing uh, rehabilitation research, you can get a sense of what's happening in, in both the brain and the body at the same time, et cetera. 
So um, this brings us to conclusion. Uh, I want to open the floor to questions. If there are questions, please do write them in the chat box or the question box, and um, Cameron will moderate them. Uh, so uh, Cameron, do we have any questions coming in? Yeah, we have uh, one question. It says, where can we see the prices? Great question. Uh, so uh, please uh, email us uh, at uh, sales at wearable sensing. We'll be happy to uh, talk with you and get you a quote and get you the actual prices depending on your uh, geographical area. We have distributors in uh, over 40 countries. So we'd put you in touch with your local distributors so they can um, set you up with a uh, demonstration, uh, explain further any technologies, do one-on-one -on -one either in person or virtual meetings and, and get you a better sense of the technology and what fits uh, your specific needs. Awesome, thanks for answering that. We have another question. How do you measure the common mode uh, channel in your presentation? Yeah, that's a great question. So the common mode is measured uh, from the headset. We have a sensor that's at the ground, which is uh, unshielded and un, um, not active. So it's right there at the forehead. And then we have a sensor that we call a common mode follower that's at the, the back of the head. So it gives us a large vector. Uh, we measure the, the, the signal between those two. Uh, so that is what is being represented on, on the screen. What you're seeing there is this vector. So it includes all the common signals that are coming up on the body, all those artifacts that you saw, but it also includes some EEG. Uh, so all that's happening, uh, there's no artifacting that, that's happening in the software. The only thing that's happening is some uh, re-referencing. So uh, all the signals get uh, digitized with relation to the common mode follower. And then um, you can go back in software and you re-reference to anything you like, whether it be the ears, whether it be common mode, uh, common average, uh, you can do all of that. And all the signals that are common uh, will get therefore eliminated by, by that uh, re-referencing. What's important to do that is to have very good gain and phase matching between the sensors uh, and to have the ability to, to deal with these very large um, uh, artifacts, which is what the common mode follower does. Awesome. Thank you for answering that. Another question is, do we have any papers um, presenting the technology just used? Yes, indeed. There are a number of publications on our website. We always wish we had more time to publish more, uh, but uh, there are some papers on our website, wearablesensing.com. There's a section that uh, has uh, a number of papers uh, that we've published describing technology, some papers uh, published by some of our users, uh, you know, specifically on their applications, and some doing some validations of the different uh, sensor technologies. And if you send us uh, an email, we have specific uh, uh, things you're interested in, we can target you to which specific paper is most uh, relevant to, you, to your readings. Follow-up question on the um, on the common mode. It was do um, are the individual channels referenced to that signal? So uh, yes, so all the channels are digitized in reference to that uh, channel in hardware, uh, and then in software you go in and you. Um, you can re-reference to whatever you'd like. So what you were seeing, the data there that you were seeing was re-referenced back to the uh, average of the ears, which is called the linked ears. Um, but in, in hardware, the data is digitized in relation to the common mode follower. That basically acts like a floating ground in which we're able to use that. So when we digitize the uh, EG signals, we don't have to use a 24-bit digitizer and digitize a huge amount of data, which is mostly noise. Uh, the common mode follower allows us to deal with that, and then what we are left with is measuring just the small EG signals with a very good resolution. Next question is, um, do you use capacitive sensing to catch EEG signal? Yes, we do. We use a combination of resistive and capacitive. So it's not just capacitive. Um, we had attempted to do just capacitive. It, it doesn't work uh, with the current technologies on the, that we had access to. Um, there are the hairs are in the way and they can, uh, if you're cursed with hair, um, then the hair can be in the way and create large uh, triboelectric artifacts. So we had to use the combination of uh, hybrid, resistive and capacitive. So both elements are working in conjunction inside the sensor. There's a resistive element, uh, ultra high impedance amplifiers, and uh, we have a capacitive element, both working together. 
Awesome. Um, do you get the ECG through the shirt? Uh, great question. So we do have capacitive sensors um, that um, you can use for a uh, pure capacitive that you can use for a through shirt. The sensors we're showing today were hybrids. So you can use them through some shirts. Uh, the signal quality is not as good as the purely capacitive ones. Uh, they can work through some thin layers of uh, fabric. There's going to be some some variability on how well they work. We recommend that you use the hybrids on the skin, uh, but for ECG signal, if you're just trying to get heart rate, um, you are able to use it uh, over the shirt and see, see the QRS complex. Um, again, you, you feel free to reach out to us and we can talk more about the difference between the capacitive only, which are designed to work through fabric, um, and currently uh, are not yet offered um, commercially uh, so they are available as uh, prototypes if you're interested we you know please reach out to our sales team let us know we can discuss um, how what it would take to get those to you to to for your specific application the sensors that we have currently on the market are the hybrids which um, would be best on the skin Thank you. Next question is, how well do people who are in bed from locked-in syndrome tolerate the cap? That's a very, very good question. So we have a number of customers today who are doing research in brain-computer interfaces and are using them on uh, locked-in patients uh, for as tools for communication. We have a few ongoing projects currently uh, ourselves uh, with different researchers exploring this further. Uh, but the, the uh, our experience from uh, has been very encouraging in that uh, people tolerate these much, much better than the uh, wet electrodes and the abrasion that are needed. Uh, there was recently, uh, just this past week, a paper published uh, by uh, Jane Huggins and Al um, this, doing some surveys of uh, patients, uh, but those patients weren't wearing the devices, they were just shown the devices. So it was a sort of a, a customer survey, a sort of a user evaluations and user feedback and they were getting great marks for the dry systems. Um, but the, the feedback that we're getting from our, user, from our customers who are using this on patients uh, with locked in, uh, who are locked in is that they really preferred it. I got the chance, opportunity to uh, work with a, a patient who had advanced uh, ALS and uh, his feedback was that he much preferred uh, you know, with a thumbs up, uh, that this was a much better uh, device than the, what he had used before, which was um, wet caps uh, that were just sort of your standard uh, EEG caps. So he had much preferred the um, dry system we used on him. And the last question that we have right now is, do the active ECG sensors go up to 40 kilohertz? Great question. So um, no, the uh, sensors we have currently, our sampling rate is uh, the default sampling rate, 300 hertz, and uh, we have a we can have an option to sample at 600 hertz in wired mode. Um, we are not sampling faster. It's not a limitation of the sensors. It's just a limitation of the electronics at the moment. We are designing these devices to um, work uh, wirelessly, and they communicate via Bluetooth. So there's a bandwidth uh, limitation there. Uh, if your application really needs um, this uh, 40 kilohertz sampling, uh, there are other solutions that we can propose. They are they're not dry, uh, but we'll please reach out to our sales team. We're happy to discuss with you some of the wet EEG systems that we have from our uh, question Chinese. Question relation, in relation to ECG sensors, by the way. Oh, ECG, sorry. Um, fair enough. Um, so on the ECG, we're, we're digitizing and for EMG as well. Yesterday, the question was asked about EMG. So for the uh, EMG, where some, oftentimes you do require higher sampling frequency, um, we are not, uh, we, all of the data is being digitized by the same digitizers, by the EEG digitizer. So either at 300 Hertz or at 600 Hertz. Um, we do not, we're not supporting any faster sampling at the moment. Again, I was just saying that you know, if we did, if you did want to go up to 10 kilohertz, we do have solutions from a company uh, that we work with in China called Neuracle. They have really uh, amazing uh, digitizers and, and electronics uh, that are digitizing up to I think 16 kilohertz per channel onto 64 channels, but those are wet systems. 
uh, and they do have the ability to do ECG and EMG as well uh, with those. Awesome. So those are all the questions that we have right now. Um, if any pop in uh, right now, feel free to shoot them over. Otherwise, thank you all for your time and joining us for uh, our webinar on our auxiliary sensors. Uh, if you have any other questions that you guys have at a later point, feel free to email us at sales at wearable sensing. And if you're interested in uh, learning more about our products or getting a, a demo, uh, feel free to uh, email there as well. Um, and the one follow-up question to the ECG was, I'm interested in the active sensor, not the digitizer. You're correct. So uh, unfortunately, uh, we need we need somehow to um, digitize the data. So our sensors do not plug and play readily into other systems. They do have uh, quite a lot of custom uh, uh, analog circuitry. So we would have to work with you to interface um, the analog circuitry with whatever digitization electronics you need. So that, that could, there could be custom development. We can do this. There's no limitation on the sensors. Uh, so if you're interested, please reach out to us. We can set up a separate call and try to explore how we can resolve this for you and, and what your specific application needs are. Alrighty, I think those are all the questions that we have. Again, thanks everyone for joining us. And if you have any other uh, follow-ups, feel free to email us at sales at wearable sensing. And lastly, I want to thank you guys all for taking the time to join us on this webinar series. So the previous one was uh, Dry EG in, from the real world to the virtual world. Uh, that's now posted uh, online. You know, we'll have a we'll send out a follow-up email to you guys with a video to that, as well as a video of today's recording. And the next webinar will be in January. We'll announce exact date uh, early in January, and we'll cover the integration of EEG with FNIR into a single integrated device. So we hope to see uh, you guys again and bring your friends. All righty. Thank you all. See you next time.